Thank you. Great. Thank you all for having me. Um, what I want to do really is to tell you the story of how TerraCycle came to be, because uh, it's a very similar path, I think, to what you guys are now just embarking on. Um, and in that story, uh, sort of go through all the you know, different ups and downs we had, where we got to where we are, and then ideally spend as much time as you'd like answering any questions you may have, anything from how do you raise money or how do you sell to retailers or all this different stuff. But I think the best way to put it into context is to really tell you the story of how TerraCycle came to be. Um, just to give you a sense of where we are today, today we're in our eighth year of business. Um, we have maintained growth of 50 to 100 percent per year. Um, we're about 80 employees, uh, five countries, uh, and uh, have really been able to expand really well. And our business revolves around one basic question. Uh, the basic question is garbage. Before I get into the question of garbage and how this all began, I want to just give you a little bit more context in what TerraCycle does, because you may or may not have heard about it. Um, so this video will give you a little example through the lens of the media on what TerraCycle is all about. It's a big way that's good for the planet, good for the economy. We can get the right food that the American dream is still alive. I mean, that's one of the wildest business ideas I've ever heard of. TerraCycle produces the world's first product where every component is garbage. A Trenton company is selling waste, and it turns out lots of people are willing to pay for it. We looked at what people were throwing out and built a product where every part of it was what people were throwing out. What we do here is even a little cooler than recycling. We're taking garbage and we're turning it into a useful product. This is the only product in the world that is made entirely of waste. We're trying to prove at TerraCycle that we can make products in the most eco-friendly way possible. TerraCycle takes ordinary garbage, like juice pouches, cookie wrappers, and plastic bags, and turns them into new products. Everything from plastic bottles, cookie wrappers, even wine coolers. I feel like a teacher is giving a lesson to kids on the importance of recycling. It starts in the lunchroom and ends up on store shelves. These students at the Bridge Academy in New Jersey are transforming garbage into gold. What they're doing can eventually turn this into this. Last year, Terracycle donated more than $100,000 to schools and nonprofits. Juice pouches become backpacks and lunch boxes, keeping 43 million out of landfills, enough to cover 237 football fields. John Zappi is turning garbage into gold. From the police on juice pouch to making messenger bags and pencil cases. This eco friendly product appeals to the Home Depot, Target, and Walmart. Walmart, Home Depot, QVC, Whole Foods, Wild Oats. A Walmart, Nemo, Target, and we will not disappoint. It looks like we have a tight order from Walmart for a lot of kites. So we can take thousands of small energy bar wrappers or thousands of cookie wrappers and fuse them into large sheets of material. And yet, here's the key, yeah. and yet, price-wise, it's cheaper. So you recognize this is a great opportunity that even though they're not recyclable, to make all close use from them. Crap sends TerraCycle its waste and sponsors collection efforts across the country. Same the earth. They get additional branding. You get a new product for kids. Everybody wins. Exactly. Oh, it's just smart. TerraCycle has gotten kids involved in cleaning up the environment, too. For every wrapper and juice pouch, students get jam. The company donates two cents to schools and charities. So I'm going to pause it there. It gives you hopefully a little taste in, in what we do. Basically what our business is uh, today is we focus on anything that is hard to recycle or non-recyclable, such as anything from a candy wrapper to a chip bag to a pen to a toothbrush and so on and so forth, create collection programs for them where we have millions of people sending us garbage. We even make a two cent donation for each piece of garbage people send us. And then we turn those pr uh, that waste into products that we then sell at the world's biggest retailers. That's basically how the TerraCycle model works today. But it was quite a process to get there. Give you a sense, um, I'm 28 now. The business started when I was uh, 20, and before that, I was always interested in starting businesses. Um, I'm originally from, uh, from Europe, and then I went to elementary school and high school in Canada. And there, when I was 14, started uh, a web design company, just sort of when the web was uh, starting. And it was really a small thing. It was my friend and I, basically, and we were doing websites for uh, our, our, you know, basically parents of, our, of the friends of ours. And you know, we got it to ten or $20,000 a year in turnover, which was pretty exciting for being 14, but wasn't really all that big. And then what happened is I always had the bug for starting a business. And the reason I'm really excited about uh, being a leader of a business, whether it's a successful one or a, one that's just beginning, is that you get to really control your destiny. You get, instead of working for someone else, you have a chance to basically say, I want to build this. I want to try going after that. And you can't. 
And that's really an amazing piece. The, the trade-off is that it's tremendously risky, there's not um, a guaranteed paycheck that comes, and your future is really in your own hands. But that's, I think, a really invigorating experience. Now. After this first successful business, I ended up going through five different dot-coms, every which one of them failed. But what was really valuable in that is that each time we started one, I learned a new thing. So for example, in the third dot-com, uh, this was, uh, I think I was 18 at the time, um, uh, we ended up raising half a million dollars. Now we never actually got the money from the venture capitalists because they went broke right around the, uh, when the dot-com crash happened, but we learned what a term sheet was, what it was like to negotiate a, a financing deal, what are the ins and outs. And these are things that, you know, we can stand up here like the speakers have today and explain to you the difference between a Delaware C Corp and an LLC or different term sheets. That There's only so much you can gain from having people explain it to you. The most important thing in business is that trying it and, and you know failing or at least getting the experience and then you learn from the next time you do it. So basically I ended up uh, coming down to school in, in New Jersey and uh, the, the way this whole business started, the honest story was my friends in uh, Toronto, this was not an enterprising operation but we had been growing plants in our basement um, that were probably better left in Canada than brought down to the US and uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, um, so they ended up moving the plants over to Montreal. They went to school to, in McGill, and we decided better for me not to take them to uh, New Jersey. And anyway, the problem was that I was the gardener back in, in high school, and I'd figured this all out. And it's complicated to grow lights, uh, sorry, plants in a basement with lights and all this. And they had started uh, trying to grow them themselves, and they couldn't make it work every time the plants would fail. And I kept getting these really disappointing updates. And then, my right around the time when fall break freshman year was coming up, um, they said, hey, the plants are working incredibly well. You've got to come up and see this. And so I convinced my roommates, basically on the virtue that you can drink in Canada when you're 16 or 18, depending on the province. Um, just on that virtue alone, we all went up uh, to Montreal, had a great party, and went into the, to this room to see you know, sort of how the plants were doing. And the plants were doing incredibly well. And the question was, well, what did you guys do? What was so different? And they said, well, it, we started feeding worm poop or worm castings to the plants. Now, if you're a gardener, you, this is not new. This has been around forever. Um, you guys are nodding, right? Like, this is nothing. We didn't invent anything here. Uh, basically, the way worm poop is made uh, is uh, worms eat. Uh, organic waste, which is their food, and they poop out worm poop, straightforward enough. And worm poop is basically nature's fertilizer. It's, it's the way nature has been fertilizing plants for millions, if not billions of years, and it works incredibly well for a whole slew of amazing reasons I won't necessarily get into today. But what caught me, what was really interesting and caught my eye was this idea of garbage. And so we started thinking, um, what is garbage? How does it, you know, why does it exist? First, it doesn't exist in nature in any capacity. There's no such thing as waste in the natural system. If you think about it, if a leaf falls off a tree, it's the most important input to the next system. If an animal dies in the forest, that animal carcass is now a very important input to the next ecosystem that's going to take it, and so on and so forth. There couldn't be waste, because if there was, we wouldn't be here today. It's not sustaining. And that's an unnatural creation in the human system, which is an interesting business opportunity, because that's a challenge that needs to be solved. Now, if you, if you look at waste, why does it even exist today? Um, the theory that we came up with is that first it's about 100 years old as an idea. Basically 100 years ago, waste wasn't like it was today. Think back to your great-great-grandparents. Back then, people didn't buy uh, uh, new things as frequently as we do. You'd have one table that would last for generations. You know, this whole idea of handing down clothing or handing down furniture doesn't really exist as much as it did back then. And if you look at it, there's two things that created waste. One is consumption. We buy way more than we ever need to buy. The other is complex polymers. This plastic bottle is a pretty complex polymer. Nature doesn't really know what to do with that. And most of the things, whether it's a computer, a pen, a toothbrush, and many other examples, are complex and nature doesn't know what to do with it. So basically, because of consumption and because of complex polymers, this idea is created. So one way to look at it is this. This is garbage. This is basically just an image of a garbage can that's been spilled out. Um, and by the way, this image, we actually took out everything that's recyclable. Just, so only non-recyclable uh, materials are pictured there. Now, go back to business, why I got really excited about it. I was in Econ 101 at the time, and if you guys have gone through or are in Econ 101, it's basically all day you're drawing these things, supply and demand curves, and you're looking at which way do they move, you know? Um, and what was really interesting to me was that garbage 
is a commodity, by definition, it's something that we're willing to pay to get rid of. So it's, in other words, it's the only commodity that intersects in the negative. And this was enough for me to get really excited that there's something here. We then, as the speaker before said, we went through a lot of research. We wrote a business plan. We realized that no one, go figure, had cornered the worm poop market. Um, there's nobody out there doing it, so there was an opportunity. Um, and, uh, and so we felt like that was something to pursue. Basically, oh, by the way, this is what the plants were like before um, the, uh, the, um, the worm poop. So after I wrote the business plan with my friends, this was basically in our dorm room, um, the next step was we had to create a prototype and validate. Very similar, by the way, to what the speaker before said in that, you know, the first step in an idea is prototyping and evaluation. So our prototyping was basically to prove that we could take a lot of this, which is organic waste, and convert it in big scale to worm poop. Now, what that meant is we needed to finance this, we, we, we designed this collection system, or this conversion system, if you will, but the prototype of that conversion system converted this to worm poop was about a $20,000 expense. That's how much we could end up getting a build for. No one would invest in us. Absolutely nobody would touch us. And so the way we did it was I had some savings um, and credit cards that my parents had given me, so those all got maxed out and my savings were used up. And we built the collection system and then convinced Princeton to give us about 10, this is about 100 pounds of rotting food waste. They gave us about 10 of these every day to deal with and to convert. And basically the way that it worked, this was now summer, freshman year, um, was spent shoveling this into the system. And the way the system looked was, first it went into that, that food waste, went into a chipper where it came out as a sludge. Um, and then from there would go into this unit, which is basically a rotating drum, and we added in air, just pumped in air uh, from the outside. And basically what it would do is it would hypercompost the waste, and it would cook it really quickly, and it would uh, take it up to a really high temperature, and that would be good worm food for the worms. And then the real innovation was this, which was our worm gin. And this idea came to me, ironically enough, we were, I was sitting on a toilet and, and, and realized, you know, the toilet is, is the world's fastest contraption to move garbage away from us. Think about it. You, pr you, know, you, you take a dump and then you press the flush button. <laughs> Within a minute, it's in another state. I mean, it is just gone. And what it realizes, is there's no animal, unless there's an exception here in the audience, that likes to hang out in their own feces. And worms are no exception either. And basically, the essence of how this worked... Um, let me just go to one of these, is that the waste would go into the middle and it would come down onto each of these conveyor belts. And each conveyor belt would be moving away from the center towards the end. And the theory was, well, how fast will worms move from their poop to new food? And the answer was an inch every five hours. We figured this out in our dorm room with a worm box. And they would slowly move an inch every five hours towards the food and leave worm poop behind. So, voila, easy. Turn the conveyor belts in the opposite direction at the same speed. An inch every five hours moving in a downward direction. The the crazy thing about this is it worked. Uh, we ended up producing <laughs> phenomenal amounts of worm poop in using the system. The challenge that we ran into, and I've learned so many lessons, I would never do it the same way again, but basically we spent all our time running the unit. It was 10 hours a day shoveling, uh, you know, basically garbage into the system, converting it. We never had time to raise money, to sell anything, and every day we were going, we were just losing all the money that we had for that summer. But we had this, organic waste to worm poop equals, or sorry, organic waste plus red worms equals worm poop. That was our supply chain. We also figured out how to liquefy it into a liquid fertilizer, which was a really cool innovation. Basically, it's like making like a worm poop tea um, that can then be bottled. Now, again, still, surprisingly, no one would invest in us. Absolutely nobody. And so we started, the only way we could keep ourselves going was entering and winning business plan contests. And so we did this in the first year, this was now sophomore year, um, we entered uh, I think seven contests, won every one of them, and each one was around, uh, in total, it was about $100,000 in, in money that helped keep the business going. By the way, if the trick to winning business plan contests is honestly, and, and uh, if, if anyone here is running one, you may cringe, but it's not about the business plan. Nothing to do with it. Most judges don't even read them. The, the most important thing, and by the way, most venture capitalists don't either. The point of a business plan is not for your investors. It's for you to figure out what's your competition, what's your market. Very important questions, but it has nothing to do with your investors. It has everything to do with you figuring out the business. What wins uh, investment is the same thing that wins business plan contests is the presentation uh, around it and how you can communicate the idea simply and clearly to the people listening and can you get them excited enough to write you a check. Um, that's the secret formula basically for raising money. 
Now, the, 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 the big turning point for us uh, as a business, uh, and one thing that I, I can advise is the downtimes in business typically bring the biggest creativity. Um, for us, this was in April 2003. We had basically exhausted all the money we had won from business plan contests. We had $500 left in our bank account, and we had entered a contest for a million dollars in funding. Now, it wasn't a million dollar prize, which is very different from a million dollars of funding, because basically we had to agree to terms. We ended up winning the contest. The challenge was is the venture capitalists wanted to come in and uh, have us just create an, an organic fertilizer, nothing to do with garbage, and to run with that. And they also wanted us to change our team, which is a typical thing, especially in young companies, you'll, uh, you'll run into, um, where the venture capitalist thinks you have a great idea, but you guys aren't the right people to run it. And they're probably right, frankly, because uh, most young businesses don't have experience, don't know what they're doing, and they're going to make the mistakes on the money of the investors, which we ended up doing um, in, in how TerraCycle came about. But either way, we ended up turning the money down, and we found ourselves ourselves in a very precarious position, which is basically we have all this worm poop. People were complaining. We had filled up all these garages in the university with worm poop. Um, <laughs> And we had no money, no sales. So basically we said, look, the solution here is we need to start selling our product. Um, and that we should have come up with a little earlier on. But anyway, that's the, <laughs> that's the answer we came up with at that time. Um, and I guess you know, you're forced into a corner. There's no other way to go. So we realized, OK, we're going to have to do this. Then we came on the question, well, we need to buy bottles. To, to, and at this point, we really uh, were excited about the liquid idea. So we had to package our liquid worm poop in packaging. So we looked at, we want to become the most eco-friendly product. The big issue, and this is an issue less so to do with starting business, but more around green and eco-friendly, is, is, is this challenge. So we looked at, what's the cheapest way to package a, bottle, a, a, a liquid? The cheapest way is in a bottle made from no recycled content. If you want to become more green, you can increase the amount of recycled content, but your price goes up. If you want to become even more green, you can go to biodegradable plastic, but your price goes up again. The issue is basically the better your inputs, right? whether it's organic, fair trade, eco-friendly, whatever you want to call it, these good inputs or better inputs, the more of those you put into a product, the more expensive it becomes. And people, well, let me ask you this question, actually. I'm just curious how you would react to it. Today, when you go to a grocery store, you can almost always see the eco-choice right beside the non or normal choice. Let's not call it non-green, but just the normal choice right beside the green choice. Who here, every time you, see, you have that opportunity, buys the green choice? Every time. Anybody? There's some like 50 percenters, so you know, sort of, right? Let me ask you this question. If they were always the same price and they, if green products were not premium priced, who here would buy the green product? Would anyone not? Okay, that's the point. And that decision is about 2%. That's the average amount that they are premium priced. I'm, I'm in the same boat as you guys, by the way. I don't buy it either unless it's affordable. The big issue is how do you solve for that? So one thing that we realized, and this is an overall truth, I think, in, in business. The, biggest, the two biggest lessons I've learned in, in creating business, and there's a difference. You know, There's an argument, just to pause here for a moment. Um, and I, I, a lot of the times, I write for Inc. Magazine and uh, talk a lot of the times to their other writers and we always have this big question is, what is the definition of an entrepreneur? And there's many ways to look at it, but one way you can cut it is there are businesses like a restaurant, a dry cleaner, a, your, you know, a, a convenience store, where you're going to be your own uh, boss, but you're running an established format which is not really built to scale, right? It's basically you're going to run your, you know, that particular shop and you're going to grow it and it's going to be a lifestyle business, but it's not one where you're necessarily going to, you're creating anything super new or something that's set up to scale. Then you have all the businesses you read about in Inc. Magazine and these others, which are the businesses that go from zero to a billion. These are ones that are hedged on the idea of scaling. And these are the ones that have financing and all the things that we typically associate with entrepreneurship. And so if you look at it from that perspective, what, are the secret, what is the secret recipe, the secret sauce you need to have a business that can go from zero to a billion or whatever big number you want to hit at the end? And at least my theory is you need to have something no one else has. So you need to be highly differentiated because if you're not, you're already set up to be in a more challenging environment because you have to compete and just uh, win by being better than the other guy. The other thing is once you've defined what it is that's so unique to you, for us it's garbage, only do that and not anything else around it. That was a big lesson we learned um, and spent millions of dollars learning that, that lesson.
But anyway, just to go back to the, um, the story, we always looked at, can we find the answer to our problems in garbage, which is, was, was, which is what is the essence of TerraCycle. And so we looked at first, you know, is there value already in waste? And so we found the current system is recycling, and then there's trash. Clearly, there's no value in trash. It's negative value. But there is value in recycling. The challenge is, how does the recycling system work? So we looked into it, and we found that when you put a soda bottle into the recycling container, um, the recycler looks at it as two things. One is the valuable plastic, which is what they sell, and that's, that's what their business is. And the second is the shape. But the shape is not valuable. In fact, it's garbage, because the recycler spends money to destroy the shape, again, the definition of waste, at least the way we look at it. And then another company has to spend more money to take that plastic and put it back into a shape of some kind. And so what was interesting is we said, hey, Eureka, right, there's something here. So we decided that temporarily, we're going to package our liquid worm poop in used bottles, because uh, then at least we can get those for free and uh, temporarily make some sales till we could afford real bottles. What was really interesting was we went through everyone's recycling container in Princeton, sorted it all out. One of us actually got arrested, by the way, doing this, because you're not legally allowed to go through people's garbage. But either way... We sorted them out and we found that there was only four volumes of soda bottles. Half liter, one liter, two liter, and uh, 20 ounce. Within each volume, the heights were the same. So you can actually run um, mixed bottles like Coke, Pepsi, Dr. Pepper bottles through a high-speed bottling line, which was a big innovation. And so what we also realized is once we found this innovation, it became a cornerstone of our business, and then we started buying bottles from recycling centers so we could get more. But what was really interesting is the world's most environmentally friendly way to package a liquid is also the cheapest. In other words, you're, when you buy used soda bottles, you're not paying for the shape, you're only paying for the plastic. And so our first product ever was this one. This is liquid worm poop in a used soda bottle, TerraCycle plant food. Even the trigger heads are leftovers from major companies because they change their designs. The only thing not garbage was the label. And so that was a really exciting moment for us once we'd cracked uh, uh, the code. And in, in both innovations, the innovation of using worm poop, the innovation of using used soda bottles came out of these unique scenarios uh, where either we had no money or weren't even really looking to start a business. And that's where a lot of great ideas come from is the places you honestly least expect them. So we have always had a mentality, and you'll see this as I go through TerraCycle, um, to go big. And the biggest place to sell any product is Walmart, so we decided we're going to try to go and take this to Walmart. And the challenge for Walmart is they, every single product company in the world is calling Walmart, wanting to get into Walmart, and they have a very limited amount of space, just like any retailer. So the way we got in, and this is a good idea, again, if you're a young business, if you are looking to get into a partner, what we did is we figured, look, the guy, the buyer, who we need to meet with, um, is going to be uh, in his office right around the change of the hour, because that's when they're in new meetings. So we decided we'd call every hour, on the hour, um, uh, from different phones, so he and see the same number popping up and we did this for like 20 I think 25 days give or take till he finally picked up and I think just to get rid of us gave us a meeting but sometimes you just have to have that persistence especially at the very beginning when you don't have anything else to go on we ended up then going down to Bentonville and met uh, with Walmart and what was really interesting is the reason they decided to say yes was because it was super green, but also because it was uh, cheaper than the other fertilizer out there, because clearly it was made from garbage, so that we had a different economic start than other products did. And so Walmart put it, uh, gave us a big purchase order, which was also funny at the time, because we had been bluffing about having factories or any real production capability <laughs> of any kind. Um, so they ordered 100,000 bottles, which we ended up fulfilling from our dorm room by using funnels and, and filling the bottles. And you can, you, can, you can put these labels on with a hair dryer. Um, you get really good at it um, after a couple you know, thousand of them. Um, and anyway, we ended up fulfilling the order on time. And then once Walmart uh, did their order, every other retailer came. You know, once you have one success, it breeds success across the platform. So Home Depot joined, Target, and so on and so forth. What was interesting is that in making TerraCycle plant food, it's like a tea. So you have a tea bag left over. We had enough worm poop to fill this room, maybe four feet high, from making all of this liquid. And so what we did is we said, look, we need to go more in garbage. So we took our garbage, packaged it in a tray made from uh, recycled paper, Paper, and that is now the best-selling seed starter at Walmart um, and Home Depot for the past three years. Basically, our garbage packaged and sold. Now, 
One challenge that comes up, and just to give you a sense of our growth, the first year we had no sales, then it was I think 70,000, then half a million dollars, then 1.5 million, then 3.3 million, and it was growing really nicely. And the issue in any business is once you grow, you're typically taking away something from somebody else. And when we were getting TerraCycle on shelf, miracle Grow was being taken off the shelf to make room for us. Well, that's not nice. Our miracle Grow won't appreciate that, and this is how they reacted. They ended up suing us. So Scott's, which owns miracle Grow, sued us, and they sued us over this uh, piece. Now, it's important to note that in case you can't tell, this here is TerraCycle and the other one is miracle Grow. The, the reason I say that is they sued us because they said that a consumer couldn't tell the difference between the two and that we had, again, just this is us here, okay, the one this way. Um, they, and, and they said that we had purposely made our product look so similar to miracle Grow that we were cannibalizing their sales and stealing their consumers. Now, this is obviously a frivolous suit, but Lawsuits are a reality, especially in the American business uh, market, more so than any other country in the world, by the way. One of the issues with the American legal, sorry, one of the issues with the American legal system is that unlike Canada or Europe, if you sue somebody and, and let's say you lose, in Canada or Europe you'd be paying both parties legal bills. Here in the US you just pay your own. The challenge is that fighting a lawsuit like this for a company at our scale was going to cost three million dollars to get to a verdict because you have to go through discovery, depositions, all this stuff and it was going to be a three million dollar legal bill to get to a decision which was an obvious one. I think you guys can all tell, right? It's the one this way. Um, <laughs> But that was, we would never get that money back. We would have never won anything. We would have just been proven right. And so one lesson here is if you're a big company uh, in America, sue every one of your little competitors because they won't be able to survive the lawsuit and that's legal. Um, and the, the challenge is what do you do if you're a small, comp uh, a small company like us? So just as a side note, um, we've, we're located in Trenton, New Jersey, which is 10 minutes, we picked Trenton. One reason is 10 minutes from Princeton, uh, but it's also the third most dangerous and poorest city in America. It's like Camden, uh, Camden's number one, then Newark and Trenton. They're all in New Jersey, which is sort of odd. Um, maybe appropriate, but anyway. Um, so we uh, we've had two buildings, or today we have two buildings in Trenton. Back then we had just one, uh, one that's 25,000 feet and one that's around a quarter million feet. And we found that graffiti is sort of another metaphor of garbage. Imagine today if I took a spray paint can and spray painted the walls here, two things would probably occur. I'd probably go to jail, which means the local taxpayers here would have to pay to go, you know, for me to go through the process of going to jail and, and all that fun stuff. And then the other side is the, uh, the museum would probably spend a bunch of money painting over the walls and fixing it. Either way, they're spending money to eliminate this, uh, this uh, type of art, per se, and so it's, it's a basically garbage. So what we did is we told everyone in Trenton, all the graffiti artists, that instead of painting illegal walls, come paint our factory's walls, because we like it. And it got so big that today, uh, every one of our walls, 300,000 square foot, like total 300,000 square feet of building, the walls are around 30 feet tall to give you a sense of scale, are repainted every three days. Every single wall. It's ridiculous. What was really fun, this is another picture by the way of the graffiti guys at TerraCycle, but this, um, as the lawsuit came in, and this was a big lawsuit, so it came in by fax, by email, by you know, telegraph, by carrier, I mean, every single way that they could communicate that we were being sued, they did, and I was getting a little annoyed at this, so we went out with my friend, and this painting was painted the morning of the suit by one of the graffiti guys. Un they had no idea we were being sued, so I took a bottle of miracle Grow. we took this photo, and this is how we replied, a six-foot version of this is what we sent back to miracle Grow. <laughs> now, we had no plan of any kind. We just thought this was sort of funny. Um, and so I had happened to be reading uh, uh, Ben Cohen's book. Uh, ben is the, one of the co-founders of Ben and Jerry's. He's since then become a, a good friend. But when he was building Ben and Jerry's back in the 80s, they had a big issue, which was haagen attacked Ben and Jerry's, not through a lawsuit, but through distribution, un, uncool tactics of hurting their distribution. And so, so, and you guys know the story, by the way, just a sense of a couple of folks, right? The, uh, Anyway, so basically Ben and Jerry's launched a campaign saying, what's the Pillsbury Doughboy afraid of? Because Pillsbury owned haagen and um, and uh, they put themselves on the map. So we took a page from their book and basically uh, launched a website called suedbyscots.com where we posted the lawsuit and said, hey, reporters, journalists, you guys make your own opinions. 
90 days later, 150 articles had been written from the cover of the Wall Street Journal to BBC News, all this great media, and then miracle Grow ended up settling uh, right around that time on really favorable terms. I can't actually tell you what they are because one of the pieces that they really stressed in the settlement was no more press and no more, um, you know, you can't uh, push it anymore. What was interesting is at that point in time, we'd basically become the leading liquid organic fertilizer company, which is not a huge deal, um, and we had beaten our, um, our you know, big competitor in a lawsuit. And, uh, you know, so the question then came, well, what was really all that special about TerraCycle plant food? And what I thought was so special about it was that it was made and packaged out of garbage. That was the central thesis of our business. Not that it was fertilized. It could have been cleaner or anything else, but that it was made and packaged out of waste. And so that begged the question, can everything be made from waste? Now, if the answer to this question is yes, then the answer to the next question, is there such a thing as waste, is no because then every waste stream is valuable, we're just not using it as, as value. And what was really cool, and one of the other things that you'll hopefully see in this story in starting a business is many times what you intend to do is not what ends up happening and you have to be really opportunistic. Uh, that's a critical aspect, at least in our success, and I think it is a critical aspect in success of many businesses. Right as the miracle Grow lawsuit was finishing, Two friends. One uh, is Seth Goldman, who runs a company called Honest Tea, which you may have heard of, leading organic uh, tea company out there in the U.S. And another, Gary Hirschberg, who runs Stonyfield, uh, leading organic yogurt company, called. And Gary uh, had yogurt cups, and yogurt cups are not recyclable. So he said, look, TerraCycle, can you guys solve yogurt cups for me? And uh, Seth said, well, we have juice pouches that we're launching. Can you guys help solve for juice pouches? So being, you know, even though we were a worm poop company, we said, sure, we'd love to, you know, take this on and figure it out. And so we first look at, well, how can you solve for waste? Now, the issue with garbage that we realize is that garbage looks like this. It's all mixed together in a big pile. If you went into a supermarket and you took every product off the shelf and mixed it together in a big pile in the middle of the supermarket, you'd basically have the equivalent of this, a bunch of garbage. The supermarket would throw it all out and order new merchandise. They would not sort it out and put it back on the shelf. It's the same metaphor if you flip that on its head for a landfill. A landfill is basically a really badly managed warehouse. There's no inventory control, there's no racking, there's no, there's no maintenance of any kind. It's just a big pile. But if you took a landfill and sorted it out into all of its basic components, like this metaphor here, then you would have a lot of value. And what we realized in going through the exercise with Honest Tea and Stonyfield was that most waste streams, if not all of them, can easily be solved. Here's just some examples. Now, the examples I'm going to show you, every one of them is in a major retailer somewhere in the world, whether it's Target or Walmart. You're going to see about 10% of the products that we currently make and sell. So, juice pouches can be sewn together into a quilt. Uh, flexible packaging can be made into everything from bags to kites, speakers, and hundreds of other examples. Rigid packaging can just simply be refilled and reused for another purpose, like taking a yogurt tub and making it into a planter. Um, billboards, movie film, corks, diskettes, circuit boards, vinyl records, and so on. We ended up coming up with a philosophy around how you do this. I'm just going to walk you through it. Really, in the world of waste, there's only three basic waste streams in, in the world of consumer product waste. One is flexible packaging. With flexible packaging, the best thing to do is what we call upcycling, which is the example with the Oreo bag here, where you just put the material into a new context. The next best thing is recycling, where you melt it into a, into a plastic, and then you can incinerate it, which means burning it, which we don't do, or you can send it to a landfill, which obviously we don't do. With rigid packaging, you can reuse. So the idea of refilling uh, the soda bottle with worm poop is the same as taking a yogurt tub and using it as a, as a planting pot. Basically, you're valuing the plastic and the shape, and then the next best thing to do is recycle and then again burn and landfill, which we don't do. With complex packaging, which is everything else, it's basically like a pen, a toothbrush, something that has many polymers meshed together in it, and it's not just one or the other type of material, there what you do is you shred it into very small pieces, separate all the pieces into its, uh, into its material category, and then from there it can be melted and made into a new product. So let me just show you some visual examples of this. This is upcycling. So everything from making an Oreo wrapper into a bow, or a pedigree bag into a rain jacket for a dog, uh, or chip bags, or juice pouches, is upcycling. 
Then re reuse. So this is our currently our lawn and garden product line. It expanded a little bit beyond just the one worm poop. We have bird feeders and all sorts of things. These are all refilled soda bottles. And here's another example of the reuse in, uh, in tubs, for example. There's a major nursery now in California that's taking 10 to 20 million tubs next year from us um, and just planting plants in it. And that's how people will be able to buy plants at Kroger and other major retailers. So that's reuse. And then the last one is disassembly and making it into a material. Every one of these plastic products are made from used uh, chip bags or wrappers or something like the trash can is made from 1500 used potato chip bags that's never been done before and so on. So basically the answer was that if waste could be separated then every type of garbage could be turned into a new product. So Gary and Seth were obviously very excited about this whole process and we came up with some nice ideas for them. The next question was well how do we actually get separated waste so we can actually make all these products. And so we came up with this idea that we called the brigades, where basically the way it would work, um, and actually just before going through the way it works, I want to just show one other thing we discovered when we did this process with uh, Stonyfield and Honest Tea, was that if you look at a, um, uh, how consumer product companies make products, they start with resources, it goes to a manufacturer, and then there's pre-consumer waste, basically waste from a factory. Then it goes to a store, the consumer buys it, and they have no choice but to throw it out. So there you have post-consumer waste. What we did is we said, look guys, we want to create a solution for you so we will come in and pick up all your pre-consumer waste for free and then we're going to create a post-consumer collection program and the idea we came up with was this basically you would go to the TerraCycle website there you'd be presented with the two brigades one for drink pouches one for yogurt tubs let's say you were interested in collecting drink pouches you would click sign up then let's say you're a school you would take a box put it out have uh, people fill up that box with drink pouches close it then download a free shipping label from our website and send it in sort of like reverse net Netflix for garbage, if you will. And then we would receive it, and then we would donate two cents per piece of garbage to the account of the collector, and they would have to allocate that to a school or a charity of their choice in the U.S. And what was really amazing is that this is a very expensive model. It costs, you know, six figures easily um, uh, a year to run even a small version of this. And in both cases, Gary and Seth wrote six-figure checks and said, "Great, we want you to implement this because it's really a cool idea." And again, goes to the point of opportunity. We were a worm poop company, and suddenly we had created a new division, which was all about collecting waste. And what was interesting, again, it never always works at the, <coughs> excuse me, the way you think. Um, we had gone out, and we were so excited about this, that we had shown retailers all these juice pouch products that we uh, were making from uh, the Honesty juice pouches. And Walgreens and Walmart and Target all said, look, we want to order this. They placed so many orders. This was just as we were launching the collection program that we needed 20 million pouches within four months. We had none coming in, by the way. Then we started the collection program, and slowly pouches would come in. Um, but really, like 100 a day or 200 a day, people started, they got really into it, but still very small numbers. The issue was that all that was coming in in the juice pouch program were Capri Sun juice pouches because that is the majority of what juice pouches are, not honest tea. And so we had a big issue. We were just hot off the tails of this miracle Grow lawsuit and we now had to get permission from Capri Sun, which is owned by Kraft Foods, uh, to be able to actually use their pouch and make a product from it. So timidly, I would say at best, we went to Kraft and said, would you guys be okay with this? And surprisingly, um, and this is where you'll notice for TerraCycle, once you, once you click on something, it's really amazing um, what happens. Kraft said, not only will we let you do it, sorry, not only will we let you do it, but here's a seven-figure check. We want you to make it even bigger than any, than any of your ambitions were with um, Honest Tea. And so the whole thing took a life of its own. It became absolutely nuts. Fast forward, uh, we're in the fourth year of the program. To give you a sense of the drink pouch program, the first year we ended up collecting 20,000 pouches, which was a huge success for us. The next year, half a million. The year after, 22 million. This year, we're in the fourth year, we'll collect at least 60 million, if not more, and it's projected to triple next year, if not uh, go up by 4x. Today, there's 10 million people actively collecting garbage across the U.S. 60, uh, actually, we're at 62,000 different collection sites, and last year, we opened up in Canada, Brazil, the UK and Mexico and this year we're opening up in 10 more countries with this exact same model. This is a map where each dot are 200 people collecting some type of garbage for TerraCycle in the US. As you can see when we opened up, um, the map for Brazil is only after four months of collection. 
The map for the UK, which is sort of hard to tell on the top right, is after uh, six months of collection. It just ballooned into this ridiculous global collection system. We have, we have offices and warehouses in every one of these countries and teams to be able to manage all this. What was also amazing, and this is the same example, like just when Walmart said yes, everyone else said yes. When Kraft said yes, not when Stonyfield and Honest Tea did, but when Kraft said yes, then all these other companies came in and are now running major collection programs. We have in total this year close to around, I'd say, $15 million of income coming from these brands to fund these major collection systems. And all that we realized was, what is, why is this happening? And it goes to this point, if you want a scalable business, you have to have something that has a very unique solution. The issue for a company like Frito-Lay is they produce 10 billion chip bags a year, which means before TerraCycle, 10 billion chip bags a year would go to a landfill. Now they have the opportunity to create basically the equivalence of a privatized recycling system around their waste stream and become as good as a soda bottle because there's now a choice on it. And a lot of these programs are now getting to be so significant that we think some of them, like candy wrappers or chip bags or juice pouches or pens, some of the larger programs, will be bigger by percentage than the entire idea of recycling within about five years from now. That's the scale we're on at this point. What was also amazing, and this goes to the point of this differentiated model, is that the brands started leveraging it a lot. They started putting us on their package. So from like the top right, for example, is every Chips Ahoy wrapper in America today, or every Capri Sunbox in America, or to show you some foreign versions, this is every chip bag in Brazil starting in uh, two weeks from now for every one of their brands. You can see right here is the whole message about how the chip bag is no longer garbage anymore. Or this is in the UK, this is the uh, a craft coffee bag, and you can see on the back explains how the coffee bag is no longer garbage. So it created this landslide effect where basically we're today on I think around 5 billion packages per year, should be around 20 billion packages per year by the end of this year, uh, highlighting this program. And again, because we had a differentiated model, the brands pay for our whole marketing and advertising. TerraCycle has never spent a single dollar on advertising in any capacity. Um, the brands do it. Here's an example of uh, an ad Capri Sun has been running. Um, or here's another version, which is the TV version of the same thing. Capri Sun. So again, what was amazing here is they send us this commercial and they say, are you comfortable with us running this advertisement uh, on your behalf? It's like, absolutely, sure. And now there's commercials in Brazil, all over the world, running this type of platform. And again, I, what I, what I want to really re-emphasize is the big lesson I learned in, in this whole process is that there's a couple of big ones for me. One is you have to look for opportunity everywhere. And it's going to come from the places you least expect. And think about you know, leveraging that because the whole point of business is not to create something that the founder is excited about. The whole point of a business is to create something that the consumers are excited about. And you may not know that. You need them, the clients or the consumers or whoever's buying whatever you're selling, to be the ones telling you what you want. And we really tried to listen a lot. And all these unique models came from us listening to what people wanted out there and how we could solve for it. The other really important thing um, that I've learned in this process um, is that you have to be very, very focused. One of the challenges that came up as this whole thing blew up under our feet is that we went from making one product to 1,500 different products. Everything from shower curtains to cleaners to um, trash cans, all sorts of various things. And it became really challenging to do that. And if one interesting piece is in our first five years, as our sales grew, our losses grew. So our, our, the peak of our losses were uh, three years ago, we ended up losing four and a half million dollars um, in making these products because we were just, you know, we're trying to get them into Walmart, function on cheap prices, and it was really hard to become an expert in all these various products. So we had another major turning point, and this goes around this idea of simplicity, is instead of making products, what we said is, look, what's so special about TerraCycle that no one else has? Well, what's so special about it is that we have all this access to waste that no one has, and every waste stream is exclusive to us. We worked in these, uh, with the contracts with our brands that we were the only company, we are the only company today in the world that is allowed to do anything with a Capri Sun pouch and has a license for that. So we were able to build protection 
But what was really special was that we had access to this waste, we knew how to deal with it, um, and, uh, and, and that was a really interesting platform. So we said, look, forget manufacturing. We went and decided to go to a licensing model where we went to major companies where, and said, look, have you guys thought about making your product using garbage. So I'll give you an example of a, a recent one. This is going to be in Japan uh, soon, I think in about six months. Sorry, it's a little weird on the computer at the moment here. Um, so here's uh, Timberland, which you may know is a, is a cool shoe company. So we went to Timberland and said, hey Timberland, have you thought about making a uh, shoe out of garbage? And this is, uh, these are various examples. Here's, for example, a TerraCycle Cliff Bar shoe. And the way it came up is we said, look, you know, we'll teach you how to do it. We'll supply you the materials. And so we supplied them the materials. We showed them how to make it. Um, and then they buy the material from us. So they basically buy the garbage that we were paid to collect a minute ago. Um, and then make a uh, shoe under the TerraCycle brand and pay us a licensing fee. What happened is it allowed us to explode our product line. Today we have everything from toilet seats to shower curtains and everything else, all made by other companies on our behalf under our brand, and allowed us to solve and scale in a way that we couldn't have had we been making everything ourselves. So basically, that's how the overall model uh, developed. Um, the one last thing I want to point on is, is you know, TerraCycle's business is basically getting garbage in and then getting garbage out. That's the whole uh, process, basically similar to the idea of recycling, but doing that for anything that's non-recyclable. Um, we've also had one unique aspect of our business is that we do not pay for marketing in any capacity. Actually, our marketing department is a profit center. The way this works is we always look for models of creating awareness that are either neutral or revenue generating. Here's some examples of how to do this. So we have a media department, about eight full-time people that just handle publicity. We get about five to ten articles a day now. And what we do is we bill that service to the brands. Because we say, you know, the whole media point is to help promote Frito-Lay or Capri Sun and what they're doing around their packaging so they pick up the cost of our media department. That's one example. Another one is we, I've written a couple of books um, which are revenue generating ways to create awareness. Or we blog for Inc. Magazine, Tree Hugger, all these other places, which again is a revenue generating way of creating awareness. The ultimate version of this is your own TV show, um, which took us about three years of flying to LA to convince a network to take it. Um, it ended up coming down between MTV and National Geographic Channel. What a strange pairing. And anyway, we ended up choosing National Geographic Channel for some obvious reasons. Um, and basically, we now have a show, which is again a revenue generating way of creating awareness, where each episode follows terror cycles. We take a waste stream, make it into a product, sell it to a major retailer. Now, the series, series one, is starting to air um, in about three months from now. It'll uh, be on TV uh, June or July, again on National Geographic Channel. And I've been approved to give you a sneak peek of one of the episodes, uh, but just give you a sense. This is episode, uh, uh, this is the Oreo episode that follows Oreo as it was converted to a product. Welcome to TerraCycle. Do you guys know what TerraCycle is? What we do here is even a little cooler than recycling. We're taking garbage and we're turning it into a useful product. My name is Tom Zaki and I'm a garbage mogul. So that gives you a sense of, that's about a one hour episode just truncated down. Um, so the last thing I want to leave you with is another really important thing uh, that we found in our business, especially as we're now growing, is what is our end game? What is our big goal at the very end? And for TerraCycle, the big idea is that we want to create a collection system for every type of garbage in the world that today is not recyclable, make that bigger than recycling, and do that in every country that has a waste problem, which is basically every country in the world. If we do that, 
not only do we become a massive company, uh, but also we do something really interesting to this idea of garbage. Remember at the beginning I showed you garbage is basically a commodity that has negative value, but if you increase demand for it, you take the price up. And the moment that the new price is above zero, it's no longer garbage anymore. It's just a commodity with value. And so our goal through this model would be to, in effect, at the end of the day, to eliminate the entire concept of garbage by creating collection systems and solution systems for each type of waste. And so with that said, I'd love to answer any questions you may have and talk about whatever you may be interested in. And thank you.